On Opening Soon by Design, a Roman luxury brand gets a new boss, a new attitude, and a new home. But Rome wasn't built in a day. It doesn't work. I don't know why the fin is not a little bit bigger. I don't want to hear it's not possible. And it's going to take more than prayers to meet the high expectations of the fashion world. It's more than a store, huh? It's a world. Fendi is a Roman fashion house, the most Roman of all fashion houses. And running this multi-million dollar fashion house is new CEO Michael Burke. Fendi is all about dichotomy and opposites and, and conflicting uh, values, just like Rome is. It's the future, it's the past, it's Baroque, it's modern, it's young, it's old. After a major upheaval due to lagging sales and a change in ownership, Fendi lost $31 million last year. Now it's about to undergo a major transformation, and it's Michael's job to restore this 80-year-old company to its former glory. You have a very long history that is embodied inside Fendi, but Fendi has also always been very modern and on the cutting edge of fashion. The only way Michael can keep Fendi on the cutting edge is by taking a big gamble, and that means transforming the seven-story, 16th-century residential palace on Rome's most famous shopping street, the Via Condotti, into Fendi's new world headquarters and the world's largest Fendi store. We have this fantastic view of Rome walking in front of you up and down the Via del Corso and coming from Via Condotti from the Spanish Steps. This being our world headquarters and the flagship and will serve as a model for the rest of our 120 stores throughout the world, it is a crucial tool in communicating Fendi through, through all of our customers. You have to be able to walk into the, the store in the future with your eyes closed, walk to the center of the store, open your eyes, and be able to realize that you can only be at Fendi. After 27 years of building flagships for luxury brands such as Christian Dior and Louis Vuitton, Michael knows that true luxury is all about the details. The flooring, when you walk on it, you actually hear hundreds of years of use. But the way it's been reinstalled, the way it creaks when you walk on it, you feel that history under your feet. Turning three floors of the seven-story palace into a modern retail environment is a daunting task. And for Michael, the challenge is to bridge the timeless quality of this ancient building with the ever-changing world of fashion. Our customers evolve, times change, and our view of luxury changes also. And this is where our designers do uh, come into play. They are the ones that pull us and push us into the future, always one step ahead. One step ahead of everyone is world-renowned New York architect Peter Marino. He's designed everything from Andy Warhol's factory in New York to Chanel stores worldwide, and he knows what it takes to create a flagship store. I don't feel I need to beat customers over the head. I'm, I, I'm really there as a background creator, and the merchandise is the star of the show. The merchandise is that is the Mona Lisa. That's what has to look great. I think Peter is a genius when it comes to understanding brand values. So this is a model of the uh, space as it existed in the old Palazzo, and then of course there are three floors of design studios and offices above this. I try to define what is the DNA of the brand and do all of the materials that I, I choose and does the design reinforce this DNA in order that people know the brand without even walking into the store. And according to Peter, the DNA of Fendi is embodied in Janus, the god of beginnings and endings, and the Fendi logo itself, simultaneously looking toward the future and the past. There's a lot of psychology here. There's a lot of emotion here. It's not cut and dry. I'm not a marketing person. I'm more the company's psychiatrist. <laughs> Well, Dr. Marino's prescription for this ailing brand includes a palette of warm Roman colors, traditional materials such as travertine, and floors that look like wet cobblestones. 
But hiring a superstar architect is only the first step in realizing Michael's plan. He needs someone on site in Rome who will be motivated to get the job done. So every support can take uh, 200 kilos. Sir. And no one's more motivated than architect Rosetta Borgia. She's new to Fendi, and this is her biggest job ever. And already she's encountering problems. Well, actually, I was here trying to understand what was happening because there was a strange, strange noise upstairs, and the compressor exploded, and I have this oil. Uh, <laughs> on my jacket, but at least not any jacket. <laughs> it's Rosetta's job to work with Peter Marino's team and turn his designs into reality. But his complex designs aren't easy to build within a 16th century palazzo. So we have to uh, maintain any ancient character of the building and we have to try to match it with the new concept that is, uh, of course, uh, traditional. Yes. I'm quite happy and I feel already part of the team, although I'm not here since a uh, long time, but uh, I really feel uh, Fendi girl. <laughs> and this Fendi girl has her demanding new boss watching her every move. I wanted to keep this mat mm -hmm. so that it contrasts with the other mm. slick stone. An undertaking as big as this isn't going to be cheap. The budget is substantial. The budget weighs in at a colossal $25 million, but it's going to take more than money to solve this problem. There's a sloping floor in the shoe section, which could cause customers to trip and fall. What's the difference? Uh, 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters. Yes. Here it's not a problem because the distance is very large. Did you talk to Peter about this? Though? We're exactly 60 days away from the opening, which means we probably have another 60 million problems between now and then to solve. Because this is the shoe department, so having a slope in the shoe department is not yeah, yes, the best of things. We do not have the solution to that problem yet. Stay tuned for the solution. I don't have it. <laughs> Opening is eight weeks away. This is, this is, this is not good. It's eight weeks before Fendi's flagship store in Rome makes its debut on the world stage. Crown moldings are being poured, surfaces are being prepped for painting, and lava stone floors are being laid. But an architect like Peter Marino knows that this high-profile corner of Rome won't be built in a day or without a few bumps along the way. My famous dictum to my staff is drawings lie. And everybody knows that. Even if a client has seen a rendering and a floor plan, and an elevation. When they see it in real life, they go, it's not what I imagined. So is it everything that Fendi CEO Michael Burke imagined? It's, I'm starting to picture it, and it's starting to look like it will work. This was, this was very hard to visualize on plans. But an old building comes with certain flaws, like that slope in the shoe department. It occurs in the division between the 19th century and the 16th century parts of the building. Michael's worried that could prove dangerous for customers. Sure, it's not going to be a problem. You're trying on shoes, you're trying it on on the slope. Yes, we think the... It's a bad idea. <laughs> and then there's the travertine curtain. It's one of the store's key design elements, and it will hang from the upper walls of the fur section. When do they actually start mounting this? We start on uh, 10 days. Travertine is a form of limestone, and most of Rome's major monuments, including the Colosseum and the Spanish Steps, are made from it. What we did is we took the very, very baroque nature of a curved stone, because Rome has so much baroque architecture, and floated the wall up above. It is not attached to the ceiling, and it floats on the upper half of the wall. It's meant to cover the rods from which the garments will hang, but at that height, it could prove hazardous for customers. The stone is hanging at a, at, at a height that is exactly the height of your forehead. So how do we make sure that we don't uh, have clients um, banging their foreheads on this travertine stone. Michael and Rosetta have decided to change the height of the travertine and the hang rods, but that presents a whole new dilemma. The hangers are going to be high. They're going to seem very high, especially if we only have jackets hanging. I'm afraid it's, the, the bottom is going to be too empty if they're hanging too high. But these issues seem minor when five weeks before opening, the world is shocked by the death of Pope John Paul II throwing Rome into chaos. Rome basically shut down. There's no way to get into the city. There's no way to get out of the city. We really shut down our entire operations. But the Fendi team presses on, flying to New York to go over some last minute issues with Peter. There are certain times that during the 
project where we do need to sit, sit around the a table and really get the feeling that we're on the right track. That cannot happen long distance. Being a long distance from his European clients means Peter has to fret about his projects from afar. I worry about everything all of the time. I mean, I'm actually only 24 years old and I, <laughs> I just have been worried a lot. As for worries about the travertine curtain in the first section, they've solved the problem by lowering the height and raising the hang bars. This means yet another costly adjustment, specially designed hangers with longer necks. I think a longer neck, neck, what do you think? Is that a a longer neck of the hanger. I think it's a great idea. Is it an operational nightmare? A little bit, but... Another challenge they need to deal with. There's no location for the belts. Your merchants would love to put the belts there. Right? So we never, we never found no a place. No way! You never, gave, you never gave us a location for the belts. Because I hate belts. Uh, yeah, well, I don't, even, I don't even think people should be wearing belts. <laughs> oh, belts are just the hardest thing to retail because they look so crappy because they're all different widths and they have different buckles and they always, they're always very difficult to organize. I don't care whether they're Italian belts or American belts. I don't like belts. It's three weeks to opening. The travertine curtains have been installed. The amber-colored glass has gone up. Glass floors in the design studios have been laid. And hundreds of invitations for the fashion world's most anticipated party are in the mail. But the pressure is on, and Rosetta's feeling the weight of it. Michael comes every day, and uh, he asks us about stitch this, stitch that. He's really perfectionist in this store, and he wants the best. Rosetta. So he, he keeps uh, watching all the details and uh, sometimes uh, something that was already decided we have to change. And the sloping floor in the shoe section? It hasn't improved with age or with shelves. In fact, the shelves have made the problem even worse. We have uh, this four inch uh, gap off the floor here on this side and only a one inch gap on the other side. It's not very elegant. Last minute problems. And we worked this well at least 10 times, and uh, we didn't see this little detail, and it's very visible. This is, this is, this is not good. Opening is three weeks away. This thing's terrible. It's like a, it's like a pimple in the middle of your forehead. Opening day at Palazzo Fendi is three weeks away. The display cases in the sunglass section are being installed. The central stairwell has been finished. And the closer opening day gets, the more Rosetta is coming to terms with the significance this project holds for her. It's uh, like a, a first step for my future career in Fendi, and I see it like a, a very important day. Opening day is looming for CEO Michael Burke, and he's got the future of Fendi on his shoulders, but at least the store finally has a belt section. The ball that Peter tried to protect. I better sell a lot of belts. <laughs> I'm sure Peter's going to ask me, how many belts I sold after, 30 days after the opening. The joys of merchandising. The danger of people hitting their heads on the travertine has been dealt with. Raise it, raise it, raise it. But now, Michael must choose a style for the longer-necked hangers. Just for the opening, we need to have approximately 400 hangers, custom-made all by hand. But with high design comes a high price. 10,000 euros of hangers. I prefer putting the money in, in the products that we sell and not in the hangers. But Fendi customers notice these details. Another detail, the Murano glass handles for the front door, is turning out to be an even bigger thorn in Michael's side. It's a crucial aspect of the store because it's the first thing you touch. 6,000 euros. 3,000 euros each bar. A bar. And when you touch that door handle, it has to ideally reflect all the values of the, of the brand. You know how many bags I have to sell to pay for these? Because they're made of glass, there are concerns they'll break. They're going to have to order another set. The worst thing would be if something happens to these the day of the opening, you're never going to get them. And our front door is now without a handle. It's two days to opening. The door handles have been installed. Romans are curious and are peering in the front door to see what Fendi has in store for them. And the merchandising team has descended. Their task? To bring Fendi's new flagship store to life. 
Yeah. Yeah. Come on, uh, Walter, pick a belt. This is for you. Uh, no, that's no, not for me. With the world fashion press about to converge on the store, the pressure's mounting. I don't want to hear it's not possible. I want interactive letters in this staircase. I've seen it in many places. I've seen it in the Guggenheim. I've seen it in many places. It's possible. So if somebody says it's not possible, say thank you, goodbye, go find somebody else. Peter Marino is about to arrive to see the finished store, and Michael's making a final desperate attempt to camouflage the problem in the shoe section with merchandise. So what do you think of the solution? Visual display saves yeah. architecture. Yes. But his last-ditch attempt doesn't seem to be working. The more I look at it, the more I see it. It's, like, it's, like, it's terrible. It's like, a, it's like a pimple in the middle of your forehead. <laughs> On the day before opening, architect Peter Marino arrives from New York to give the store his stamp of approval. I don't know why the fin is not a little bit bigger. More extended. Yep. I really want, I really want another little floating shelf right in the middle of the floor there with the luggages on them so they look unbelievably desirable. That's pergamin. Do you like that wave? Love the wave. Love the wave. Now the hangers the hang are great. The hangers are great. And what does Peter think of the one detail that has haunted Michael from the beginning? It doesn't bother you? Not in the slightest. No, it was because we were concerned that you wouldn't like the dive platform effect there. <laughs> The verdict is in. Peter loves the store, and Michael's happy. But he knows that there's still one more group to weigh in, the fashion press. And to impress them, he's concocted a last-minute publicity stunt, filling the newsstand out front with fake Fendi newspapers. Get your news! All the news! <laughs> but will the press buy it? Uh, it's a new concept, a new retail concept. Opening is one day away. It's opening day of Palazzo Fendi, and the party is eight hours away. The newsstand out front has been filled with newspapers bearing Fendi headlines. A sculpture by world-famous artist Anish Kapoor has been installed at the top of the staircase. And upstairs, artisans are already at work on next season's collection. Preparations are in high gear for tonight's party, and head designer Karl Lagerfeld has just arrived. I think it's great. I, I wouldn't say it's a store. It's a palazzo, it's a building. It's more than a store, huh? It's a world. Things aren't going smoothly for Rosetta. It doesn't work, or it... Yes, I found out. As she deals with last-minute problems, Michael and Peter are facing their biggest challenge yet. This is Michael Burke, Hi, Hi. CEO of Fendi. Press is hell on earth. Remember, architects, we, we're, we're visual people, not verbal people. The often vicious international design press has descended to give their verdict on Fendi's new flagship. Michael and Peter join Karl Lagerfeld and luxury tycoon Bernard Arnault, chairman of Fendi's parent company. A difficult uh, enterprise like Fendi, to turn that around, requires uh, many things, but most importantly, it requires a team of people that respect each other and probably work a long time. It was good. It's good. It's good. Very, uh, I think, uh, there were some smart questions, but I'm always disappointed that most of them only have to do with numbers and not fashion. They want to know, they want to know, are the sales figures going up? And that means that I did my job. So it's beautiful and I think it's the spirit of Fendi and I think it would be immensely successful. Just go on and finally, Palazzo Fendi is ready for its coming out party. Throughout the store, Peter Marino has used contrasting architectural shapes and materials as a testament to Rome's varied ages. Accessories are offset by travertine shelves and slick lava stone floors, reminiscent of wet cobblestones. The entrance from Via Condotti is dominated by an amber glass archway leading to an inner courtyard. In stark contrast to the rest of the store, the finish in the staircase is a dark industrial gray. Upstairs, travertine floats from the upper half of the wall, allowing the garments below to shine in the spotlight. It's opening night, and the press scrambles for photos of Karl Lagerfeld and actress Monica Bellucci.
Rosetta finally has a chance to celebrate. I think it's a, it's a, a success for me. I will put on the list of my success. <laughs> but I've been convinced, deeply convinced, that the only way to pull off a project like this is to do it for the first time. And I don't think she would have done this had she already done it before. Rome declares the new Fendi store a success. It's very nice. <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here and Fendi is just incredible. Fendi is Fendi. The architecture of this building is everything. <laughs> but the most important critics for Michael, his family. They're the only sane people, so without that sanity I don't think I would, uh, would have been able to succeed. We're very proud of him. Yeah, we are almost sad that he doesn't realize that he worked so much and everything is wonderful. Just appreciate what you did. <laughs> He's always aiming really high. And very exhausting. Uh, and good thing it's over. Good thing it's over. And I hope that we do a million dollars in sales tomorrow. <laughs> Palazzo Fendi, a study in contrast, taking Fendi and Rome into the next century. Well, um, we have the opening, the next big flagship that I'm opening will be the Louis Vuitton in Paris on the Champs-Élysées, which will be the largest Louis Vuitton in the world. And uh, there's a lot riding on that. It will be more than 2,500 square meters and is again an enormous freestanding building. So there'll be a lot riding on the new concept that we'll unveil.